So Joey, how's Nam been? It's been good, um, productive. Actually, that's the thing that I've been like freaking out about a little bit because you, normally, you, you know, when you have a company, you have a booth here, you're an exhibitor, you know, you're dealing with all of the complexities that come with that, right? Like who's showing up to the booth? Are they getting there on time? Like, what do you need? Do we have the setup right? Do we have all this stuff? People blowing you up for different purposes, but when you don't have a booth, like none of that happens, right? So you just get to focus on like why you're here. And uh, yeah, we've just been walking around like, the craziest thing is that we've had zero game plan. Like the whole plan was just show up and be here. And that's worked out like amazing for us. Like we've gotten so much done just by walking around. So it's been awesome. That's awesome. And uh, what's some of the favorite stuff that you've seen? Um, well, Nam always brings out the the new stuff, you know, it seems like, but we're off on a different schedule right now where Nam is happening in April. Normally it's in January. So some exhibitors are showing the same things or they're showing something that they showed like a year ago. And that's understandable, right? Because you have uh, like the economic situation that's going on. You had just came out of a pandemic, workforce is changing where a lot of people are going remote. So I think it's a little of a complicated time where you're not seeing a lot of like new innovative, innovating things, but uh, you know, I saw some stuff from the Sonox team. Um, the new EQ that they are working on is really cool. Um, I, I've seen uh, the new microphone from Audix. Uh, it's got really, really good off-axis cancellation. I was really surprised by that. In addition to the, the other stuff, like, uh, I actually haven't had a lot of, like, opportunity to really see a lot of new stuff in NAMM. Like, mm -hmm. I saw a couple things, but it's been more just, like, catching up with people and, you know, which has been great because we've been unable to really talk to people because of the pandemic. And, you know, NAMM is obviously a great opportunity to come in, speak to everybody, see what everyone's up to. And it gives me a lot of ideas on like where to focus our products and stuff. Cause I, I sit down and I talk to our users like face to face and I talk to like creators face to face. And that teaches me like, oh, you know, people think this thing about this product or they think this thing about this idea. And it guides me into uh, product ideas, which I end up, you know, eventually creating hopefully you know well you know you are an inspiring dude when it comes to getting things done you have <laughs> you know it's it's been amazing to watch you go from the sneak forms you know through all the amazing success you had making records into starting jst and urm and pushing all of these you know truly what i would consider educational products you know there's a lot of stuff that's you know made for making great records but there's a lot of stuff that you do that teaches people how to be better engineers. And I'm curious on your thoughts behind that, you know. Um, what do you think is, you know, your greatest achievement when it comes to helping the future of this career? Well, I look at it like I've put in a lot of man hours into creating albums, you know. Mm -hmm. I've created over 100 albums with various artists all over the world. And when you kind of go through that journey and you look back, you look at the trail behind you, you're like, what did I actually do? And it's like, at the end of the day, you know, if you had to describe it in five words, you're like, I made a hundred albums. Like, what does that mean? And it's meaningful in some ways, like, cause you're creating music that helps people communicate different emotions and you connect people together through the message and the language of music, which obviously that's great, but it's only so meaningful. And I felt un, under challenged is probably the best way I could put it is that if I just sit here and just make 10 records a year and just keep doing that, or I'm making, I cut it down to five and, but they spend more time on them. Like, what does that all really mean? So at the end of it, I realized that I have ideas. I want to make stuff that helps people make music in a different way, not necessarily just like drum samples or whatever, but like tools. And I've gotten more fulfillment out of doing that than I, I don't want to say that I ever did making records because that's just a different type of fulfillment. But like I've gotten more out of helping other people like pursue their dreams of creating music. And it's, it's just this grander idea of like passing the torch. You can't be an amazing pr producer for forever. The music changes, trends change, you get older, you know, your hearing kind of starts to go like, there's all these things, right? So. 
I start looking at that almost like a, like a mortality situation where it's like I'm running out of time. Like I need to use my brain and the way that I think to do as much as I can for this community before I can't do it anymore. And that like race, um, you know, you feel like you're you, there's people behind you and you're like you're running out of time and like that that's what is exciting about it is it's what gets me like inspired to do it you know mm -hmm. and i i feel like i'm now part of a greater conversation because i'm i'm creating the tools that other people are using to create their albums which is more than i could ever do just with my own two hands yes you know and so by doing that i'm inspired to continue that journey to make those things even better make even cooler tools more useful tools and I get more fulfillment out of it because I know that I'm I'm affecting the music community in a much larger scale than I ever could just with just with like a computer and two studio monitors. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's really what gets me out of bed is to to just continue on that path. That's awesome. You know, I have to say when it comes to talking about you being inspiring, I really believe that you changed the game forever when we were younger on the Sneep forums because. I remember growing up and everybody in the world wanted, or everybody in my world wanted an SSL, whether it was an AWS like Andy or a 4000 like Chris and Tom, everybody needed an SSL, you were never going to make a rock record that people wanted to fucking listen to, and then Zombie came out and everyone was like, what the fuck do you use? And I remember the post where you said, I use a Countryman Type 85 Di, my Persona's FirePod, and an SM7. And, dude, it, it changed the game <laughs> forever, you know? And a lot of people want to say things like, you know, lowering the bar. And I don't believe that is what it is at all. I think that what you did is give people the confidence that what they had and what they were doing was enough to be great and make great records because you made records that people wanted to fucking listen to. You made records that I wanted to listen to, you know? And I think that when you go and take that into something like URM and, you know, all of the information and knowledge that you've been able to bring to this industry, I think of you as like the OBGYN of, you know, <laughs> guitar-based music. Personally, you're birthing the engineers who are going to make the next 20 years worth of this shit. And those guys are going to go on to inspire the next 20 years after that. And really, if that, that sneak form wasn't there, you know, I don't think that it would be on the path that it's on now. The sneak form was obviously a giant contributor to everything that's happening right now. Yep. In a big way. I mean, we're talking Bulb, Misha, Periphery, Get Good. Yep. You know, those, all these things have transpired from there. All the people that are doing cool shit right now, Kazrog, um, you know, JST, like even URM, um, all this stuff is inspired and came from the, the foundation of that community. And none of us could have ever seen it from that period. Like if, you know, if you would have told me like that kid that made that, <laughs> that post, that comment, if you would have said to him like, Hey, you're going to have like a, you know, software company and you're going to have like 30 plugins and all this stuff. I'd be like, what are you talking about? So that's, what's really wild about it. And I think that Andy Sneap is a great example of how you can have that trickle down effect. Like you have such high standards, you have such excellent execution on records and you create such a huge I guess inspiration for all of us that we do something with that energy that energy comes down through us in different ways it made some people go on to become great mastering engineers some people went on to do mixing but the energy that he um, put forth in his records like like dispersed out into so many different ways. And I look at other people too, like Ross Robinson, Mutt Lang. Um, these guys inspired me in big ways too. And it's that similar type of energy where, you know, you see somebody do something great, you're very inspired by it. It, it 
makes you want to go and be great in your own life and do it in your own way. And so, like, I think we owe a lot to him for that. And I hope I get to meet him someday and just, you know, shake his hand and be like, dude, thanks for creating the forum and inspiring the hell out of all of us because we wouldn't be here doing this if it wasn't for that, I don't think. Absolutely. You yeah. know, I, I was inspired by him, so I was there, you know, just lurking in the background. And it was an amazing time. And you're right, there's still so many people. You know, we, we just sat down and talked with Seth Munson, and I remember, you know, meeting him through the forums way yeah. back in the day. So, you know, if, yeah, of course, if we could ever sit down and thank him, that would be an, yeah. an amazing thing. Um, so tell us about JST. Tell us what you're excited about. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, being inspired, you know, clearly there's people who inspire you with making records, but there's got to be people who inspire the way that you're doing business now, you know, so I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, well, Joyster Just Tones actually started out, I mean, you can even tell by the name of it, if you like go back and look, I had Joey Sturgis drums, which was like my drum samples. And then I did Joey Sturgis tones because people were bothering me on Twitter about my guitar tones. And I was like, all right, well, if I can sell drum samples, I can probably sell these tones. Plus it's kind of a pain in the ass to explain it over and over again. So I felt like if I just give it to you and then you can see how I made it, like it'll answer every question you would ever have <laughs> about how I did the guitar tones. And I would, at the time I was using Pod Farm, so it was very easy to just be like, Boop, here you go. Like, here's the file. It's got everything. I bought some, you know, yeah. uh, with Pod Farm, and then you had EQ 10 and 7 presets. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> like the, the mixing presets yeah. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So that's how it started. And, um, you know, my buddy called me one time and he was like, you know, you've got the drum samples, you've got the guitar tones. Like, you should just make a plug in. And, to me at the time, and I think I was just really busy or something, but I was just like, dude, that sounds so daunting. I, I, I don't think I'm going to pursue that. Like that's, you know, you have to compile for, you know, AAX, AU, VST, like for Windows, for Mac, for <laughs> all this stuff. Um, but then uh, I had like a week open up in my schedule and an itch to just be like, maybe I could make a plugin. So I started fucking around with it. I actually spent you know, over the course of like six months off and on was just messing around with this idea where I was trying to nail down like the vocal compression, you know, shape, the, the knee shape, like the ratio, the attack, the release, like the perfect settings that would work pretty much on any vocal that I had ever touched is, is like where I started. And that's gain reduction. That's right? gain reduction. That yeah. became gain reduction. And that was the first, I wrote that and made that and it was only compatible with like, you know, 32-bit windows for Cubase that's it. <laughs> um, but I put it out and people were really into it. And then I contacted um, uh, a guy named Boz from Boz Digital and was like, hey, you know, I've got this plugin. It seems to be doing pretty well. I would like to, con you know, have your help to convert it to all these different formats so that we can sell it for like, you know, for Mac and all the other formats that I couldn't do. I wasn't capable of doing and he's like, yeah, sure. So we worked out a deal and then we went on to do like a couple plugins together. And that, that was really the birth of like Joey Sturgis Tones. And as you start at any kind of company, I feel like you, you start off with one idea of what it's supposed to be. But then as time goes on and more and more people use your stuff, you kind of figure out where you really sit and where like you fit in. And I think over time we figured out that what JST is supposed to be is this Pro, the solution-based products for music creators of all types. Basically, if you're a person that records your own vocals, you have no clue about mixing, well, you can use Howard, Benz, Howard, Howard Benson vocals and you're good. Or you can put gain reduction on there and you're good. Like you don't need to understand like ratio versus attack release threshold. How does compression work? You know, what's the difference between a VCA and an opto? Like if you're a vocalist, you don't care about that stuff most of the time. So that's kind of like our been our approach to product creation is to like basically build tools that help music creators get to their creativity faster and like eliminate any of the barriers that come in between that process. And, you know, we create some tools that are a little on the, 
more technical side, but we also have those easier, like, I don't want to call them one knob plugins, but you know what I'm talking about. No, like, no, I mean, that, that's a, a theme of this year's name, and I can't say that Make Believe isn't involved in the show because we make plugins that have one fader that goes from left to right, right. but, you know, <laughs> there's multiple people here who are trying to come up with solutions that enable people to make music quicker yeah. that they're happier with exactly you know because yeah. even back in the day when you got pod farm you know i had pod farm for two years before i bought your tone and then finally got something out of it and really you know inspiring you know i never thought to crank the presence that high on the plugin yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 or to like you know suck out all the 4k that they had in their their dsp or whatever so yeah yeah like those are the kinds of things where it's like the risk taking is what i believe you need to do to get to those innovative um conclusions that that's been my approach from the start is like i don't really care about conventional wisdom or traditional techniques like I just know what works for me and what sounds good to me and like I put it out into the world and people grab that and they they uh, they relate to it they like it so there has to be something right with that like you know absolutely it's kind of that mentality if it is if it sounds good then it is good like and I know that goes only so far but um, for me it's gone far enough and that's why I continue making products because I think you know, there's a market for it, and um, I'm proud of what we what we create. You know, like JST for me is like this whole other outlet of my creativity, which I used to put forth into records, like just sitting down and being able to be creative with the songs and the production and all that. It's that that just goes now into building a business and creating a company culture and providing like jobs for people, but then also building cool products and like making the user experience easier to understand and making sure that the flow of the checkout process is like smooth and like all of these things i use my creativity on those things now when i used to put that towards records and i like that more because you know i feel like i'm using more of like literally my produ producer ability my ability to like produce something is used way more in in the business than it ever was on a record because mm -hmm. on the record it's like hey man, like your fills are boring, like you should spice them up. And it's like, all right, that's a little ounce of energy used, you know, and then but by the time you end the record, you like, you only did so many things where it's like now I'm like commenting on graphic designs and logos and what kind of fonts should we use and what kind of spacing do we do in the Instagram post and like how do I talk to this person to get them to perform better and like there's so many challenges in running a business and actually um, doing this like with a with an organization um that it that's perfect for me i like to be challenged i like to have you know to have a lot of thought and energy put into things that's why like one of my side hobbies is mixology you know it never ends like you can combine all kinds of liquids to create cocktails and, and drinks and things and it never ends and it's all these combinations and you learn about new ingredients and how they're made and where they come from and then you learn about the history of like why the spanish people make it this way and like you know <laughs> it's like so what you know it, what's your favorite drink then well right now i'm really into like boozy drinks like manhattan's old fashioned you know doing like spin-offs on those kinds of things like take a you know take a uh, a negroni but take out the gin and swap it for mezcal and you know, I'm in. I'm into like those kinds of things right now. You're thinking about something new. One thing that I've noticed is you guys have been hitting hard with these artist series plugins, the Howard Benson stuff, the Joel Wanasek stuff, and they're great. Yeah. You know, um, it, do you have more of those that you intend to do? And you don't have to get too deep into it, but you know, clearly, I think that aligns with the virtues of what you say you're trying to accomplish with the company, um, especially when it comes to being able to bring in different people's vibes to things. So, you know, I know so far most of the stuff that JST has done has been based around rock music, but you've been trying to explore a little bit outside of that. And, you know, I would love to hear you talk openly about how that's gone, because I know that there's been some trials and tribulations from, you know, talking to you a little bit already. And, you know, um, what do you think that you can do, you know, to hopefully 
hit the country people and the pop people and the R&B people the way that, you know, you should be hitting them because you're making great products that they could all be using. Yeah, well, it kind of ties into, like, how I felt as a producer. Like, when I was a producer and I did these metalcore records, it kind of puts you, like, on the map for metalcore. So now, you know, this metalcore band does an album with you and then they go on tour with another, another metalcore band. That band wants to then do a metalcore record with you and it just kind of snowballs and now all of a sudden you're like Mr. Metalcore like this is what you do and you get like put into a box and it's hard to get out of that box because you're known for doing good work in that genre and so the same thing sort of happens with the plugins like you know you see this metal producer uses gain reduction deluxe on his vocals and this metal producer does this thing with your and uses jst clip and on and on and on and now all of a sudden like you're the the plug-in company that's in the box for like metal music and rock music and you're not i just want to put it out there i work on a lot of you know different types of music and all of these records that people keep calling progressive r and B. I i want to say jsc stuff is all over it and i've been using it forever and awesome. you know um, you can definitely, if you go check out the uh, Ghost Note records that I've done and, you know, the uh, stuff that I've done with Terrace, anytime there's hand percussion, I'm always using Transify. Nice. You know, the uh, the top two knobs on Transify, being able to crank the gain on those individually. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It reminds me a lot of Waves Transex from back in the day. Right. Um, very, very comfortable with it. And then also, you know, um, I love gain reduction on bass nice you know it's one of those things where you've got to game reduction seems like it has an eq curve you mm -hmm. know that it does. you know that is shaped for a vocal you right. know so it kind of actually pulls out the bass a little bit you know but if you go and you boost the shit out of the bass with a paltech into gain reduction it creates this very thick sounding wall that i like a lot that's awesome so you know, great job on what you're doing. Um, Thanks. What plugins are you excited about that JST's come up with? Well, like, so kind of going back to what you were saying about like the collab thing. For a time, we kind of felt like, okay, you know, JST, we want JST to succeed as a plugin company where it can just make its own plugins and, and that'll work. And that's just sort of a, a greedy kind of thing that you pursue as a as a business naturally because you want to create your own products and you want people to you want to be able to survive off of your own products, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but music is, in essence, a collaborative thing. Like, even if you're just a solo artist, you're probably, I mean, you're using instruments and you're, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there's probably a mixing engineer mixing your stuff. So there's always, there's pretty much always collaboration. And I don't know how I convinced myself that we shouldn't collaborate so I've sort of had this big like turnaround where I'm like, oh, we should absolutely be collaborating with like anyone and everyone and all of the time. And we realize that we're not the best at everything. I'm, I'm not the best person to make impulse responses. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the best person to judge like how, like Howard Benson, for example, came in and was like, yo, if we do, um, a vocal multiplier we should use like a sample and hold algorithm and i was like that's really smart never thought of that so i think collaboration is actually the most important thing that we need to pursue as a company and that's why we had you guys make like the impulse responses for tone force disruptor that's why like we reached out to um howard to do like the vocal multiplier because he's very passionate about vocals and vocal production and he ended up using like the, you know the DSP that we created for that. It's all over the In Flames record um, to make you know that guy sound huge. And he doesn't do a lot of double takes because they're so unique. It's purpose driven. It's solution driven, but it's also collaborative, collaborative driven. And I think that that's an important thing that we're going to embrace now, like moving forward. And um, I think that it will create better products. You know, we're already talking to people here at Nam about doing some stuff and. You know, like you said, like what, what plugins am I excited about? Well, it's the things that people bring ideas to me and they're like, man, why doesn't this exist as a plugin? And I'm like, oh, that's, that's a great idea. Let's make it together. Yep. You know, that's what I'm excited about. I want to create stuff with my friends and, uh, and creating stuff with you guys too has already been such a really cool process. And 
so yeah, I, that's what I see the vision being. And, and also, why why can't there be like, um, like a Sonox slash JST plugin? I I believe you know? that there should be. You know, yeah. and I, I think you know the same thing. You know, there's a lot of great things that people have done already, and there's a lot of great ways that people utilize those things. And if people can come together to bring those two parts of the pu puzzle to the public, I think that it's, you know, priceless. So yeah. if there's anything that we can do together, you know, we are 100% behind what you're doing and we'd love to be involved. And, you know, if Sonics has a, a great new equalizer that you love and you find an interesting way to, you know, utilize it, you absolutely should, you know, link up with someone like that and do that. You yeah. know, I, I believe that, you know, when we grew up, there was always this thing. You had to be a Glassjaw fan or a Deftones fan. Right. Or you had to be a Mesa Boogie fan or a Marshall fan. And it's like, you know what? I would love if they would make one amplifier that had the top end of this 800 and the bottom end of this rectifier. Right. You know? Yeah. So um, I think that when you come together with guys like, you know, Howard and Joel and the people that you've been working with, you know, I think it's very, very exciting. And also... You know, what I loved about, you know, Howard's vocal plugins from the time that I've spent with them is that there's classic sounds in there. You know, there's things that I know instantly, okay, he's going after, you know, something like a 910 or a 949 with that vocal double. But there's also ones that are entirely new sounds that are very, very cool. And I think that that's really nice that, you know, when you guys are sitting there, it doesn't seem like you're just trying to recreate something for what it is, you know, there's some innovation happening and some conversation that's happening and, you know, whatever it is, continue doing it. Yeah, I, we never wanted to be the company that emulates, um, you know, 1176s or <laughs> whatever, you know, it, to me, it's not something I really understand. You know, I don't think that I, I'm not a hardware tweaker. I don't sit around and play with gear all day. So for me to sit here and be like, hey, I, I made the most perfect copy of this piece of hardware it would be me lying to you, yep. you know? And so that's not um, anything that I was ever interested in. And I was always like, it, I, I always wanted to go after the new ideas. That's why I was so afraid to call Toneforge an amp sim because you're saying the word amp simulator. It's like, I'm not simulating any amp. Like, I'm making my own amp. Yes. You know? And so I, I look at our tools to, to continue to innovate in that way. It's all about, like, how can we bring something new and interesting to the table? It's fresh. It sounds good. And it's a useful tool, a creative tool, or a creative take on a technique that's been done before, but we've figured out, like, a different way to do it. Like, the sample and hold thing. Um, that's what I get excited about, and that's what... I want to build. That's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to something like Tone Forge Disruptor, you know, this is your newest product out on the market, and it seems like you guys really went to the next level as far as not only your marketing materials, but also just the general design of the plugin, how thought out the plugin was. There's some very, very innovative new features in there, particularly things like DI match, where I don't know if that's the exact term. That's for right, it, yeah. You know, but, you know, being able, you know, who, when you're sitting there, you know, and I can have this conversation in my own head. Someone's sitting there and he's like, well, you know, when they're playing at their house, it's going to sound nothing like his fucking guitar. And you're like, yeah, you're right. You know, what we need to do is have something that listens to their guitar and then EQs it back into a match EQ pretty much so it sounds like his DI. And what's interesting is like when I sat down with this Raptor when we got it for the first time, you know, it was very surprising because his guitar sounded very fucking different than my guitar. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. I like my guitars. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. That was the eye-opening thing. And that's why, I, like, we, we thought about it this way. We're like, okay, you know, there's a million amp sims and the market is super saturated and there's like everybody has a, a signature model or whatever, right? So what are we really doing here? Like, are we just adding another signature model to the to the game? And I started to think about, like, what are the real problems here? Like, one of the biggest problems was that you'd have, a, like, somebody who would download a free trial and they go on your YouTube and they're like, oh, I think it sounds like crap. And it's like, okay, at this point, we're, it, it doesn't sound like crap. 
Like, we're not, you know. You're not trying to make shit. No, we've been here mm-hmm. for 10 years, bro. Like, yeah. it's not, we're not making <laughs> crappy plugins. Like, so you have to then dig deeper and be like, what's, like, like being a producer, being a musical translator. The vocalist tells me that the fucking guitars are too loud, but, like, maybe it's just his vocals aren't loud enough. Yep. Right? You have to like dig deeper and find what the real problem is. So we looked at it and we go, all right, well, you're probably using like a $400 ESP six string tuned to drop C. And this tone was made for an eight string tuned and drop F or whatever the hell. And it's like, those are dif- different things completely. Like they do not It was sound- a $1,500 ESP, but yeah, you're fucking, yeah, you're hitting, <laughs> yeah. the, you're hitting me right in the heart with you know, my experience <laughs> with the plugin. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and then when you also go in and you, you look at these things on like a spectrogram, um, spectrograph and you like take a snapshot of it or whatever, you're like, oh wow, look at all that, look at those like high end dips that are over there. Mm-hmm. Like why isn't that, on my DI, why does this tone sound so brittle? It's like, oh, well, your guitar doesn't have any low end. Like, Yeah, and you're pumping tons of high mids through it. When his guitars, you know, especially when you go to those lower ones, they're very, very thick. There's an absence of highs almost. Right. So um, that's when we got the idea to, to do what we do with cymbals. Like, you know, in cymbals, you have these ringing resonances and these frequencies that are really harsh, and they, they happen around the, you know, the baby crying place the 2k to 4k where we're all programmed to hear that like so um you know having the ability to spectral match your di to another guitar that was intended for the preset like gets you to a place that's closer to the intended sound and that's the thing that we couldn't control before the di was always the variable that you couldn't do anything about and now with di match you at least have the you know it's not a complete solution but it gets you 99% 99% there in most cases. The reason why I say that with confidence is because I feel like a guitar really at any given moment is only doing a couple of things that are sort of like in a a frequency zone. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's not playing all frequencies. It's no. not full, you know, it's not you can get away with losing like almost all of your fidelity above like 12, 14 K because it just doesn't matter in the guitar. So because of that, like you can really get super close. Like even if it's wildly different, those frequency spectrums are going to be wildly different. But when you match them, they get really close because the part that matters is like the mid range and that low mid range. And I think that's what we really got right on the product to offer something to the market. That's like not just another signature Ansem. It's like, there's tools in here to actually get you what you need or what you want to hear um, and to do it in a way that's like foolproof. Absolutely. And, you know, for me, I just think it of DI match, you know, one, I can totally understand how someone who gets that out of the box and they've got their first guitar and they're going to try that out. It's instantly going to get them closer. But how I look at it is it's just another creative decision. I was landing closer to about, you know, 65% DI match because when I would DI it out, it would, you know, definitely make it thicker, but it would take away some of the high end. And I was able to dial back in some high end just with the DI match instead of starting cranking presence and treble and stuff across the amplifier. And I think things like that are very, very exciting because you're now in the realm of taking two guitar tones and making a sound out of it, Mm -hmm. you know? And there's no way to shove his fucking eight string and my six string into one Marshall, you know? So when you start going down lanes like that, those are things that make me pumped. And you talk about Tone Forge building new amplifiers, you know? that is a whole new concept for the front end of every fucking amplifier, yeah. you know? And I think things like that are very exciting. Yeah, and the, you know, the string mode, the tuning mode, where you can actually tell the plugin, like, hey, I'm playing in this tuning. It goes in, adjusts some of the white box modeling circuits so that they can handle those low end frequencies that are now gonna come into play. Mm-hmm. You know, when they were designing these, like JCM 800 amps or whatever, back in the day, like that's a, that's designed for a six string guitar in E standard. It's not meant for these like eight string monsters with these low ass frequencies and stuff. So, you know, with the tuning mode and the optimizations that we can pull inside of the plugin across the board, you know, we can make those things work better for your scenario. And I I think that's going to be important to people in this market now, now that we um, have sort of crossed the, the finish line of what, amp sims are and what they can be like 
th these are the kinds of features that, like you said, like they're exciting. This is going to change. And, and we're going to go back. Like we're going to go to Toneforge Jeff Loomis, put in string mode and optimizations and Absolutely. Right. You, you know, and I can't wait till you start going through and you're starting to find your favorite guitar players and you're seeing them in the front of new amplifiers that you designed based off of, you know, circuits that haven't even existed before. Right. You know? Yeah. So and when you start talking about working with other companies, you know, there's no reason why there shouldn't be the mid range from a diesel and the top end from a fender and, you know, the bottom yeah. end from a Mesa Boogie. And as we go and we progress, you know, people are making great stuff all of the time and you know just like you know any rectifier that you really grab is going to sound completely different from the next one any rectifier plugin that you grab is going to sound kind of different from the next one so you know as you start working with more and more collaborators i mean there's tons of people out there i'm excited to see what you come up with man yeah us too i mean that it's always this um, it's kind of like writing a song where like, you know, you start with one idea and by the time you get to the end of the song, like that original idea is probably not even in the song anymore. Yep. You know, like that's kind of the cool part about making plugins is that like, especially um, the one we did with Howard with the vocal multiplier, I can show you like 17 different designs of that plugin. They're all different. And we trashed all of them until we ended up with that final one. Mm -hmm. And it's just like writing a song. Like, so I find it to be a really fun process. Um, I think that uh, collaborating with people is a really great way to create new tools that are interesting. Like, you know, if you're just doing it by yourself, you kind of, you're working inside of a vacuum of your own mind. And you're, you know, sometimes those are, those are great situations like Game Reduction Deluxe. Um, other times it's like way better to work with people. So are you still programming yourself then? No, um, I did program Game Reduction. Mm -hmm. And then we turned, when we, um, ported it for all the formats, I asked the guy to, uh, Boz, I was like, hey, can we add a mix knob too so it's in parallel? Yeah. And like that was part of like making it deluxe. Yeah. But um, ever since that first plugin, I didn't, I haven't written any of the plugins because right off the bat, we were like, oh, this is a thing. Like, this is going to be a big deal. Like, we need to like get programmers. We need to like get a quality assurance technician. Like, we need to get customer support. So right away, we started building a team and it didn't make sense for me to make the code anymore. So at this point, do you have developers in house or do you have mm -hmm. developers that you work with offsite? Is it a mix of both? Everything's in house. Okay. Um, even the content teams in house, marketing's in house, programming's in house, quality assurance is in house. Uh, we just started playing around with getting other people to help us beta test, mm -hmm. but we've also famously just done that internally. Mm -hmm. I've always been f afraid of like, giving out software before it's ready. Yeah, <laughs> but now I'm opening up to it because when we did it uh, for Disruptor, we got so many um, tickets that really helped us improve it at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Like things that we didn't think about, like user experience, things that were strange, bugs that we didn't know about. Like I've, I've found as things have progressed because we had beta testers that we started with, you know, and as things were going on, they they were learning with us, you yeah. know, but then you give them to that beta testers that only got it, you know, a week before release and all of these things that you've added and changed as time went on, they're just like, what? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I have found it to be very, very helpful. Plus, you know, people fuck up their computers all the time and then when they do that, they think that your shit breaks it and it's just like, really, it's kind of just the fucking, you know, final straw that broke the camel's back. The most annoying thing is freaking <laughs> graphics. Like whenever the graphics are slow, it's always a dumb video driver, but people think the plugin is doing it. Mm -hmm. And like nothing frustrates me more than being like in session, like engineer sitting in the chair, we're working on a part with a vocalist. I have a perfect idea of how I want it to do it. And I'm like open Howard Benson vocal mul multiplier, set it this way. And like they do that. And like in front of me, the plugin starts like crawling yeah. and I'm like, Oh, it's a stupid graphic bug again, and the, and then like the engineer just close it, and I'm like, damn it! <laughs> you know? But it's like those are the things that like when you see that happen, you're like, this is what other users are going through, mm -hmm. and nobody want like that's the opposite of the effect that we want to have like at, on music creators. We want them to open the plugin and just have it be snappy and it works great, and they understand it, you know. But that's not always the case, and so having a you know additional beta testers, additional machines that are strange or have um, abnormal configurations 
is really important into the quality assurance part of the process. Yeah, we've been stacking up our own little weird museum of computers because, nice. you know, we make jokes that we're, you know, making versions for Sega CD and stuff. People, <laughs> people want you to support these things all the way back to the 80s pretty much, which is just impossible but you know have there been a line in the sand are you guys strictly 64-bit moving forward you've left all your 32-bit stuff in the past yeah we um we kind of try to stick with where the industry goes and yeah for us actually that does we have a few requirements because of how we how we're set up you know we we protect all of our plugins with iLock so yep. you know that puts you in a certain box and then also um you know the whole vst thing where you know, everybody was kind of forced to move on to VST3, so that like kicks out a couple of things that you can't do anymore. Um, and the 64-bit uh, architecture support only is nice because then you only have to have like one development environment for the programmer, so he doesn't have to worry about like maintaining these old, you know, um, IDEs and all this stuff. So we we try to just stick with where the industry goes, and we and I feel like at the end of the day, people want to complain about like these subscription services and all this stuff. It's like, dude, you're giving Apple like three or four grand like every three or four years. And if you calculate that out, that's like paying 200 to $300 a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like what's the difference here? So um, I like to think of it as, you know, we want to be um, lean and mean. And in order for us to do that, we have to not support things that are too complicated to support. Yes. Um, and that's okay. I, I feel like the majority of people have moved on. If there's anybody out there still running Windows 7, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's like how I feel about it. <laughs> no, no, totally understand. But, you know, all of those things I believe are growing pains, you know. And mm -hmm. to watch you guys grow, you know, vicariously through the Internet has been, you know, enlightening, inspiring, and interesting all at the same time because, you know, as you come out with something new, it seems like every time there's new people who are instantly attracted to it. But then there's these people that seem to hang out and just dissent negative opinion. And it's one of those things where I've noticed that there's patterns that these people aren't just going after you. They're the same people who do the same thing all over the industry. Mm -hmm. and. I have a problem, you know, the, the null police can go fuck themselves, right. you know, and it's very interesting to think like how mad these people get <laughs> just because something exists, you know, they don't have to buy it. Some of them you can tell they never even demoed it, right? <laughs> yep. but they're on gear slots and they're mad, dude. And yeah. it's so funny to me, you know, who has time for that? They clearly don't have time to make records if they have all that time. Uh, yeah, and I think maybe part of it is that they, in their own mind, they see how the product could be different, like in their, like the way that they think it should be. And maybe it frustrates them that they have no outlet other than to just complain about it. And I understand that actually, because like from a user point of view, I kind of relate in a bit in different markets though, not just with plugins, but like, you know, I'll look at like a car and I'll be like, okay, why didn't you put this safety feature in there when it's available in tons of other cars? Like, so it's very easy to be the, the what do you call that? Like the, the armchair quarterback or the, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Backseat driver. Backseat driver, like, <laughs> okay, bro, start your own plug-in company and do it right mm -hmm. if you think you got, got the ideas. Um, but also I think that it's important for consumers to understand that it's, it's basically impossible to have a perfect product. Like, you have to make sacrifices in some ways. Like, you know, the number one request for us right now is like, please make a pitch shifter pedal. And it's like, okay, but you, do you realize that like science hasn't really figured out like how to do a real time polyphonic pitch shifting algorithm that doesn't sound like ass, yep. you know? And so it's like, you can't teach the consumer that they don't understand it because they're not the ones creating it. And so I think that it, it would be nice if there was, um, a little bit more of a platform to have those kinds of conversations to make consumers understand why tools are made the way they are, where the sacrifices are, are put into those tools and why it, it is that way. Um, but it's like impossible. So the best you can do is just be like, 
all right, well, we did, you know, we did our best, and if you don't like it, then... Well, and, it, and it's hard because the line in the sand where we're at currently is the laws of physics. Right. You yeah. know, and people don't fucking understand that. They're like, well, you know, it doesn't exist in the hardware world at all, but you're in the computer, and there's lots of stuff that exists in the computer that should exist. It's like, no, like, they would have put this into a fucking whammy if they could do it, bro. Like, yeah. you can't fucking do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They'd be making a lot of money, you know. Yeah, you know, they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's very interesting. You you said pedal though, and I'm curious. You know, is JST something that lives completely digitally, or is there hardware on your mind as well? Because you were a dude who lived mostly digitally. Yeah, I look at it as purely software, yeah. um, and I think that that's a really good place for us to focus. Yeah. Like a, like just to give you another example, one line in the sand that we drew a little while ago because we used to sell like courses and stuff. Is I felt like all right, well. It's kind of like you have this thing called, I, I call it the circle of focus. And it's like a, you know, it's a circle, like a pie. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you say, well, I'm going to do content marketing, but I'm also going to run ads. Well, now that circle just got chopped in half. So you can only focus half of your time on content marketing and half of your time on ads. Or you can change the shape of those slices, but no matter how you do it, you have one circle and you have only so many slices. So the more slices you put in there, in that pie, the more focus goes away from each individual thing. So I, I felt like, you know, it was smart for us to just be like, you know what, anything that has anything to do with education, it's all going to be free. We're, we're not even going to focus on trying to sell that. We're not going to focus on advertising it, any of that stuff. It's just free. You can learn from us for free. Go to our YouTube, go to our blog. Go to our Instagram. We teach you there for free. That's cool. That's going to attract people to us as a brand. However, when it comes to plugins, we aren't doing free plugins. We're selling plugins. That's the products that we make that we want to sell you. Do you have any free plugins on the market currently? No. Because I remember I got Sidewinder out of a magazine. It used to be free. Was Yeah. Did it come up with computer music? Is computer that, music mag. Yeah. And it, there was a computer music version, right? Mm -hmm. It said it in the plugin. Yep. Yep. I love that thing. Yeah. And then the <laughs> algorithm that we wrote for it turned out so good that like it was like a smash hit. Yep. Because it's the mono compatible thing and we did different versions of it. So then we made a Sidewinder 2, which I, that's fully on a product that you can just buy. Mm -hmm. um, and we did like, I think we gave it out to all the previous owners because we wanted to do something nice there. Hold on, so since I'm a computer music owner. You can the, get it. Oh, tight. Yeah, there's a form you fill out and, and we send it to you, so. Okay, Yeah. I'm gonna fill it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah grab that, grab that bad boy. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think that were like really important for us to like grow is to just find these little areas where we need to focus and then just like stick to it. Mm -hmm. So like if JST all of a sudden is like, okay, well, we're making guitar pedals. Well, that circle of focus comes right back. Yeah. Now we cut it in half. Oh, wait, half of our time is focusing on selling pedals, making pedals, supporting pedals, shipping pedals, doing RMAs. Like, and, and, I, and I saw a perfect example of that, and I won't name the name of the manufacturer, but there's a manufacturer in Pro Audio who's been in Pro Audio who, you know, they've clearly delved into not only the podcast world but now they're getting into the gu guitar profiling world and now they have guitar pedals as well to go with their profiling efforts and you know i'm pretty sure that they have three booths at nam and i saw my buddy derek running from booth to booth <laughs> <laughs> well you know and i'm not saying that you can't do that like you know you look at amazon and it's very impressive what they've done because they they have like one of the world's best online shopping experiences they have one of the best like um product shipment mm -hmm. fulfillment centers with trucks and all these things they have like huge logistic network for that they have one of the best like online aws systems where you can create like literally things like netflix run on it and all this right so that's impressive but that's a huge organization with all kinds of different micro corps and mini corps that all work together and stuff for us we want to just be like a really, 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 really good plug-in company. Yeah. Like, and so if we put our entire circle of, uh, yeah, circle of focus into that, um, I think that's the only way we're going to get there. Hey, I think that's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, again, inspiring. So at this point, how many people work for you over JST? So the whole thing, if you combine JST and Drumforge together, because we kind of, we share workload with, mm -hmm. with our talent, is 17 people. Okay. And a lot of the people 
within the team within both teams are designers and video people because you know we're living in a world now where like when you need to present an idea it's a video mm -hmm. you know when you need to show something it's a graphic and it's like if you don't have enough of those those people you don't have enough of that manpower then um you fall behind because there's people out there like creators right now on instagram they create a new instagram reel every day they create a new tiktok every day like to do it in the way that we want to do it where it's polished it's it it looks awesome it's very clear and easy to understand it sounds great it looks great it takes a lot of people yeah so a lot of the people on the team are actually just for for media production content marketing etc so you know help me with the breakdown of the company structure you know from my understanding you've got drumforge mm -hmm. which is you joe and joel that's right? right yeah and then you've got jst which is your company right right and then you've got urm which is you al and joe joel joel yeah. yes and okay so when it comes to the media production team i've met a lot of the urm guys just over the years you know uh -huh. nick and stuff do they handle media stuff for you guys as well or those dudes seem relatively busy is that a completely separate production it's a team? separate island yeah yeah so urm is its own island simply because of how big it is mm -hmm. like it just has way more needs Yes. Uh, well, I wouldn't say more needs, but let's just call it different needs mm -hmm. than JST and Drumforge. And you can imagine that JST and Drumforge are very similar. Yes. Like pretty much the only difference is that like Drumforge focuses on samples and drums, and then JST focuses a little bit more on like audio processing plugins. Yes, and uh, you know everything else it seems. Right. You know guitar yeah. amps and great tones. So, you know I think that that's very very interesting and. At this point, you know, clearly it seems like your day-to-day -day focus is on JST and Drumforge yeah. in, in that world. How does your interaction with URM happen? Are you mostly at this point a content provider for them when they need you to be? But, I, I mean, clearly you're out there every day interacting with people. And Well, I'm a founder first and foremost, right? So we started it. Oh, no, 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 of course, of yeah. course. I'm just talking about what, what do you... Today's yeah. day looks yeah. like more like board meetings... Mm -hmm. Making company decisions, doing finances, yep. handling royalties, doing things like this that um, actually I do a lot of regulatory work, which is it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely, with the giveaways yeah. and stuff yeah. across countries. Yeah, and, and, and like dealing with like state um, government, state taxes, like yep. dealing with like you know um, employment laws and different. So you're you're heavily invested into the back end of that. Yeah, it's still very much a part of your day. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. I didn't know it was one of those things where that had become a well-oiled machine, and they were like, "Hey, we need jo Joey to come in and you know pinch hit a great guitar video for us." Right. You know yeah. What I, mean? Um, I mean, I just <laughs> I'm naturally good at things that are like. Um, how do I word this? Like I like the boring mundane, mundane government bull crap where mm -hmm. it's like a form and it's got like, you know, you have to fill it out this thing and you have to do it like every two years and all that. I'm good at that. Yeah. I don't know why, but it's just like in my wheelhouse. Okay. So it got put on my lap, which I, I kind of volunteered for it too. I was like, I know you guys aren't going to do this right way. So like <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> hey, no, no. You're the guy who keeps the wheels on. Right. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, and you know, that's a very, very important thing, you know, to be able to handle because every company needs something like that yeah. and especially with the size that URM has grown to you know kudos yeah congratulations thank you yeah to do that and I, I I like it I like spreadsheets I know that sounds weird but that's truth I mean I spend a lot of time inside spreadsheets man so I'm the right guy for the job <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's awesome, man. This has been a wonderful interview. And if there's anything that you know any of us over at Make Believe can do to help you guys, please just say the word. We yeah. want to be there for you. That's badass, man. Same, same goes for us. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joey. Yeah, thank you.